Yeah, when I think about Palm Sunday, my soul, it grows happy. I grow happy because on this day, I consider God's love. I consider his commitment to all of us. Do you know that God, that he is committed to you today? God, he is truly, he is committed to us. And in his commitment, we have hope. That's something that I hope that you would understand today, that we have hope. Our hope it is salvation unto everlasting life in the kingdom of God. That is something that I truly do hope that all of us understand today. So here in my message in my sermon for today, we will see that not everyone wants us to have hope in our heart. Not everyone wants you to live with hope with hope in your heart. Many, they will wonder why you are so committed to going to church every Sunday. Some will wonder why you are so committed to, to praying to a God that you cannot see. Some, they will again, they will wonder why you are still so faithful when you don't even have much drive around in a broken down car, live in a house that's leaking, right? Live in a house that's falling apart. They'll say, man, God ain't good to you. So, so wow, are you still so committed to him? So we read responsibly today there from the sixth chapter of Hebrews. And what we are going to do today is answer the question as to why it is that we are still so faithful. We're going to answer the question today, why it is that we are still so committed to the Lord. And we're going to do that today with my key verses that comes from the sixth chapter of Hebrews there. My key verses for today will be the 17th, the 18th and the 19th verse. That is again from the sixth chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. That's going to be the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th verse there. If we have that, let us say amen. amen. And if you have it, say amen. amen. You got it, Andrew? Amen. All right, we'll see the scripture. It reads, it says there, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Then there in the 19th verse, the scripture says there, this hope we have as a what? Anchor. We have as a what? Anchor. For where? The soul. For where? The soul. For the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. That's again from the sixth chapter of Hebrews, my key verses there, the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th verse, where the writer said that we have hope. We have hope that is an anchor for the soul, the writer said there. And our hope the writer said there rest on two immutable things that make it impossible for God to lie to you. Do you think that God has lied to you today? No. Do you believe in what God has promised to you today? I'm only hearing a few voices here. Do y'all believe in what God has promised to you? So from those verses there, I want to focus on, and I want to talk about today for a thought, your walk of faith is not for nothing. 
Again, my thought for today is it's not for nothing. Do you hear me here today? Your walk of faith, I want you to understand today, again, we're on the path to glory. Your walk of faith is not for nothing. You see, your walk of faith is not for nothing because salvation that has been promised to you, not by me. I haven't promised salvation to anyone. Salvation that's promised to us by the one who sits high and looks low. Salvation that's been promised to us by the one who is almighty, who is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Salvation that has been promised to us by none other than the Lord. And something that all of us must understand today is that when God promises us something, God, he is faithful to what he promises. Now, for those that will say to themselves, well, pastor, I haven't heard that a million times. For those that will say, well, I haven't heard that God is faithful, but he hasn't shown himself to be faithful to me. To those that say, I done prayed and I done prayed and I done prayed, but God hasn't did a thing for me. You know how people are. You know, some can say that. I want to show you today that God, he is faithful. And then I am going to get you to consider why it is that you think that God doesn't move for you or why it is that the Lord isn't faithful to you. You see, God, he has proven his faithfulness. We've seen it in word where the Lord, he made a covenant with Noah and in the covenant that the Lord made with Noah, the Lord, he said that he would never again curse the ground nor destroy every living thing because of our sin, because of mankind's sin. God, he promised Noah that seasons that they would still occur. He promised Noah that seed time and harvest, they will still occur. If you don't believe me, it's over in the eighth chapter of Genesis in the 21st and the 22nd verse, <laughs> where we see God's covenant with Noah. Did the Lord, did he live up to what he promised to Noah? Well, here I stand today. I'm still in this world. Andrew, he got a smirk on his face. I imagine that he sees where I'm going with this one. The earth is still spinning, ain't it? You know, we're going in a season, a new season right now. Spring, it just began. And, and we have enough pollen on our cars to clearly see that the seasons, they still exist. So I don't know what y'all would say, but I would say, hey, I'm still alive and well. The earth is still spinning. The seasons, they still exist. There, there's still a harvest that always comes around. I say God has been faithful to it. If there's anyone that, that is trying to destroy the world or trying to destroy mankind, it's us, ain't it? I heard you say it. It's us. We, we destroy ourselves before, before God will destroy us. God, he, he made a covenant with Abraham, didn't he? And in the covenant that he made with Abraham, he told Abraham, I'll make you, I'm going to make you a great nation. God, he promised to give Abraham some land and said, your descendants, they will get that land. Was he faithful to Abraham? Well, through Abraham was, was Isaac, right? Isaac was born. And then from Isaac, there came Jacob, who was later named Israel. And through Israel, through Jacob, he had 12 sons who gave birth to the 12 tribes of Israel. I, I believe that they became a great nation. The Lord even brought them to the promised land. And then the Lord, he also promised Abraham that, that through him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. If you don't believe me, it's over in the 12th chapter of Genesis. You can look at it from the first to the third verse where the Lord made these promises to, to Abraham. 
Was God faithful to what he's promised? Because someone may look around, they may say, well, I don't have no fancy house. I don't have no fancy car. I don't have no fancy clothes. I'm not blessed because, you know, we think that we have to have some, some material possessions in order to be blessed. Well, let's, let's, let's verify whether or not the Lord was, was faithful to Abraham. You see, through the seed of Abraham, many generations later, there came a king named David. And the Lord had a promise to David. The Lord promised David that one will come through you who will establish your kingdom. It will reign. It will last forever. He will sit on your throne forever. The Lord made a promise to David. Was he faithful to that promise? Well, many generations later through David came a woman named Mary. And guess who Mary gave birth to? You know, Mary, she was visited by an angel named Gabriel, wasn't she? And Gabriel told her that she would give birth to the one who would sit on the throne of David forever. And that one that she gave birth to was none other than Christ himself. And you see, this same Jesus he told Nicodemus in the third chapter of John's gospel and the 16th verse, whosoever believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. That is life forever. This same Jesus, he willingly laid down his life to be our propitiation. He laid down his life to be our atonement offering. You know, when, when you give in to the whispers of that old man that be sitting on your shoulders saying, hey, it's okay if you do this one sin, you'll be all right. And then you go off and you commit that sin. And then you be feeling real bad about it because you know that you disobeyed the Lord. He laid down his life for you. So I would say that this same Jesus, he fulfilled the promise that was made to David. And, and I would say to you that this same Jesus, he fulfilled the promise that was made to Abraham. This same Jesus, he fulfilled a promise that was even made to the serpent in the garden that was made to the devil. When God told the devil that you will be defeated. When God told the devil in the third chapter of Genesis and the 15th verse that he will bruise your head, that he will crush it because that's how you defeat a serpent. And see, this is the same Jesus that has made the pathway to glory. He has made it possible, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. This same Jesus, he has made this path that you and I, that we say that we walk down. He has made this pathway possible for us. All the families of the earth can be blessed if they choose to go down the narrow path. Are you blessed today? I see some nodding of the heads. So God, he has pr proven that he is faithful to us, hasn't he? Yes, in scripture, but in our life as well. I don't know what God has done for all of you individually, but I know what he's done for me. I know where I was back in 2016. And for over those five years, I know the condition that I was in. But I know where I stand today. And I know that where I am standing today, that it is not possible by my own strength and by my own might. It is possible because God has made it possible. It is possible because God has been faithful to me. And I imagine that all of you 
can say the same exact thing. You are where you are today, not by your own wisdom, not by your own knowledge, not by your own might, but because God has been faithful to you. So there in the sixth chapter of Hebrews, in the 13th verse there, the writer wrote of how the Lord, how God can only swear to himself since there is no one greater that he can swear to. You see, God, in order for him to be faithful to us, he has to first be faithful to himself. So with that in mind, I, I would say to you all today that God, he is not going to lie to himself. I would say to you that God, he is not going to cheat himself. You see, if God, if he lies to you, then he's lying to himself. If he has lied about salvation, he has, to us, he has then lied to himself. If he would cheat us on salvation, he would cheat himself. And God, he is not going to do that. He is, again, faithful to himself. So if you say that God is not faithful to you, I would ask you the question, are you faithful to him first? Do you truly believe and trust in the Lord today? You see, James, he wrote over in his letter in the first chapter of James and the sixth verse, he wrote that when one asks, when one prays to the Lord, he said that they should ask, they should pray in faith, James said. He said that they shouldn't ask, they shouldn't pray while doubting in their heart. He concluded there in the seventh verse that those who doubt and are of no faith, they shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. I want you to understand something today. That if you do not believe in the Lord, if you do not trust in the Lord, if you aren't faithful to God, you should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Now, anyone who denies that God is faithful, John, he said that they have a certain kind of spirit about them. Over in 1 John, the fourth chapter and the third verse, if you happen to turn there, you'll see that John, he wrote that those who do not confess that Christ has come in the flesh, he wrote that they are of the spirit of the Antichrist, John said. You see, the spirit of the denier, they deny that salvation is of the Lord. You and I, I say to you today that we have to be conscious of those who have the spirit of denial. We have to be conscious of those who have the spirit of the Antichrist. As much as you may desire to stay on the path to glory, they are those who will do their very best to knock you off the path. Again, they will come to you and they will wonder why is it that you are so committed to the Lord? They will question your faith. They will question your commitment. They will question your trust, all trying to poke holes in the foundation that you are walking on, that you are standing on today, that you live on today. Those who have the spirit of denial, they will preach their word. And they will preach their word and their word. It goes against the hope of God. It goes against the salvation of the Lord. It goes against the promise of heaven. They will tell you that your walk of faith is for nothing. 
They will tell you that there is no prize at the end of the road for you. Do you believe that today? See, these are those that work against the spirit. And I tell you today that the spirit that they are, that those who are of that spirit of the Antichrist today, those who are of that spirit of denial today, I would tell you that they are very active in our world today. And how often has anyone ever come up to you and they said to you, God, he must not love you because you don't have. It often makes me wonder why do they want me off the path to glory so much? It often makes me wonder why is it they, that they want me to deny the Lord? Why is it that they want me to doubt God? I often I begin to wonder about those who have that spirit. As you have heard me say before, they believe that they know better. They believe that they know what is better than the promise of God. Is it the lust of the flesh? Is it the riches of the world? Is that their hope? Is that, the, is that what they want me to hope in? Because that's what they grind and they hustle for and they think that that's what makes them happy when it does absolutely nothing for me. What is it that can possibly be better than the premise of salvation? What is it in this world that can possibly be better than the premise of entering into the kingdom of the Lord? What is it better in this world that is better than the glory of God. I don't know it because again, it's certainly not the lust of the flesh and it's certainly not any riches in this world that is better than the riches that's waiting for me in the kingdom of heaven. Those that blaspheme the spirit, I tell you today that they will have their reward, but you ought not be joining them in receiving that reward. So to those that would tell you that your walk of faith is for nothing, I say to you today, turn away from them and do it immediately. To those that would tell you that you hope in nothing, I would again tell you, to turn away from them and to do it immediately to those that will tell you what you can not do to those that will say you can't go to heaven to those that will tell you that you can't be saved. I, again, I would tell you today, turn away from them immediately. And the reason why I would tell you to turn away from those that try to, to create doubt in your heart today is because Jesus, he has said that all things are possible to those who believe in him. Do you believe in him today? As Jesus said of such, those who deny him, they are of their father, the devil, and there is no truth in them. They don't have a word to say to you that you should believe in. Turn away from them. Turn away from those that deny the Lord. Turn away from those that deny his promise. Turn away from those that deny heaven. Turn away from those that deny salvation. Turn away from those that tell you what you cannot do. Because God has said you can do anything through him. See, the truth is that Jesus, he promised us that if you can believe, all things are possible to you. That is the truth that you should believe in. That is the truth that you should walk in today. The truth is that you should never doubt God's faithfulness. You should never doubt whether the Lord is committed to you. Because God, he is committed to you. And so with that in mind, let's look at my key verses for today. There in the 17th verse, the writer spoke of, again of 
how God was determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, that is his faithfulness. The heirs of promise, as mentioned there, the heirs of promise, that is us. That is all who confess faith in their hearts in the Lord. That's you and me, all who believe today. So to show the immutability of his counsel, we'll see that the writer tells us that God, he confirmed it with an oath. Now let's be very clear about that statement there from the writer of this epistle here. For all of us who are of sincere faith, we should understand that God, he has first made us a promise, a promise of salvation. And then on top of that promise, God, he has made an oath. He has made a vow. The Lord, he has took a pledge. He has made a pledge on top of the premise of salvation. Do y'all, do y'all see what that, that says there? Do you understand what that means there? Don't you understand what that means there? Because you see, a lot of us, we have become numb to promises, right? You know, politicians, they make their promises and, and we, we go numb to them, right? You know, someone come up to you and they say, Hey, I promise I'll do this for you. And we look at them like they are crazy nowadays, don't we? And, and the reason why it, 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 it is because, well, a lot of folks come up and they say that they're going to do something. They promise that they're going to do something, but they always break their promise. Don't they? People are quick to, to break their vows. People are, are quick to break their oaths. And, and so when, when someone come up and they say, hey, I promise I'll do this for you. I promise I'll do that for you. We roll our eyes, don't we? And, and we just turn around and go the other way. We say, yeah, okay, uh-huh, is what we do. However, if someone, if they make a promise and then they add a vow on, on top of it, they say, I'm serious about this. You know, we start to take that promise a, a little bit differently, don't we? We start to think to ourselves, okay, maybe they are serious about it this time around, don't we? Now, God, he has made an oath on top of his promise. God, he must be serious, huh? About what it is that he has promised to us about salvation that this journey, this walk of faith, that is not for nothing, that there is a prize awaiting for us. You see, God, he doesn't have to ever make us a promise. And then to add on a vow as well, God doesn't have to do those things. And the reason why God doesn't have to do that is because again, he has proven his faithfulness. We, we see it in word, but again, in our life as well. But again, he wanted to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. His faithfulness is what scripture says there. And so again, the Lord, he made a pledge about what it is that he is going to do for us. Not only has God made an oath, but we'll see there in my key verse for today that the writer said that God made an oath on two immutable things, two things that cannot be moving, two things that cannot be shaken, two things that cannot be torn down, two things that cannot be broken. So again, I want you to understand today that God, he is very serious about the promise of salvation. God, he is very serious about what it is that we hope for. Again, I don't know about you today, but my hope is not this world. I don't want to be here forever. I, I see enough of the nonsense and the mess that goes on in this world for me to want off of this rock when my time is called. I, I want to be where God is, where there is peace, where there is joy, where there really is life. That's my hope. That's where I want to be today. And so God said, son, I'm serious about what it is that I promised to you. 
They may run around and say, hey, you running this race for nothing, but I'm telling you today, it's not for nothing. Now for the first seal of God's promise to the heirs of salvation, we don't have to look all that far for the first seal, if you will. In the sixth chapter of John's gospel, in the 38th verse, Jesus, he said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me is what Jesus said there. Now here's some pages turning there. If you get over there to the sixth chapter of John's gospel, you will then see that Jesus said there in the 40th verse, a verse that I've been referencing a lot over this series of sermons you see that Jesus, he said, this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. Now, this is clearly Jesus there promising that there is an eternal reward of life, of deliverance, of salvation from sin and from the world. Now, if you turn over and you take a look at the 22nd chapter of Luke's gospel, you will see that at the feast of Passover, there in the 19th verse there, the 22nd chapter of Luke's gospel, you'll see that Jesus, as he began to institute the new covenant between God and us mankind, that Jesus, he gave the disciples the bread and he said to them, this is my body, which is given for you. And then after supper, we're told in scripture that Jesus, he took the cup and that he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which we know again is shed for many for the remission of sins. And by the next day, Jesus, he was hanging on a cross. As we saw in our Sunday school lesson today, Jesus, he was hanging on a cross between two criminals like he was a criminal. When we said in our Sunday school lesson, the worst thing that Jesus had did was raise Lazarus from the dead. The worst thing that Jesus did was heal the lame, cause the blind to be able to see again but he was there hanging on the cross between two criminals like he was a thief. And Jesus, he hung on that cross and he was shedding his blood, which again, he said was the blood of the new covenant. Talking about a seal of what God has promised to us. Jesus, I want you to understand today. Jesus was saying that he is a seal of the promise. One of those two immutable things that the writer of the epistle to Hebrews said. Jesus said, my shed blood is for the many for the remission of sins. This cup, which is filled with my blood, it is representative of the new covenant. Our salvation, as we saw in the Sunday school lesson today, it was sealed right there on the cross. It was confirmed for us. In that same moment, when the thief said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me, the thief confessing his faith, repenting from, from his ways of wickedness. And then, as we saw in our lesson today, Jesus looking at the thief and then saying to the thief, assuredly, Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you today, not tomorrow. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said to the thief, assuredly. Jesus, he answered the thief with authority over the premise, didn't he? Assuredly. He said, Jesus, he was 
not guessing, he was certain. Assuredly. Don't you understand? Assuredly, that's what Jesus, he will say to you and has said to you when you make that confession of faith in your heart. When you, when you know him, Jesus says, assuredly. That's what he responds when you cry out to him. When you need him. When you need him desperately. When you are weak. When you're going through your trials and your tribulations on the path to glory. When the storms are like, when they roll in while you are on the journey to glory, Jesus says, assuredly you will overcome. Assuredly you will make it through. Assuredly you can and you will make it. Assuredly is what Jesus says. You see, Jesus' assurance to me is why I don't care what no denier has to say about the Lord. You hear me here today? As I go on this journey, my eyes are on the kingdom. I don't care what some denier has to say about my salvation. I don't care what some, some doubter has to say about my chances of entering into the kingdom of heaven. And the reason why I don't care what a denier has to say is because I have the truth. Jesus, he shared the truth with me. And again, Jesus said, you can assuredly, you can make it. This is why we must keep forward on the journey. Your walk of faith, again, I say to you today, it is not for nothing. There is a reward. No matter what anyone else says, no matter what the denier says, there is a reward that is awaiting you in the kingdom of God. That is why the son was given. Do you believe that today? And I say to you that the Lord is committed to you. Are you committed to him? If you are committed to the Lord today, repeat after me. I am committed. I am committed. I am committed to the way of the Lord. Amen. Now, the writer said two immutable things. We have seen one of them. Let's take a look at the second one here. Now, if you turn with me over to the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, I know I got y'all doing some turning today, but y'all know who I am about my cross-referencing. Over in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, the Lord had a word to share with Jeremiah. And if you take a look at the 31st verse, you'll see where the Lord said to Jeremiah, I got to make, I got to make a new covenant. That's what the Lord said there. He said, I'm making a new covenant. And when you look at the 33rd verse there in Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, you'll see that God said to Jeremiah about this new covenant. He said, I will put my law, that is the new covenant, he said, I will put my law in their minds. And he said, I will write it on their hearts. You see, the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, it was written on, on stone tablets. It was engraved on stone tablets. But you see, those stone tablets, when the children of Israel, when they were busy dancing around that calf of gold and they were bowing down, worshiping the calf of gold, Moses, he came out of Mount Sinai and he took those stone tablets and he threw them down to the ground and those stone tablets, they shattered. But here the Lord says that I am not going to engrave the new covenant. I ain't engraving no new covenant on those stone tablets to be broken. He said, I'm engraving this new covenant on the hearts of those that believe. 
That is a seal. A seal of, of salvation. A seal of the promise. Now, I don't want you to think for one second here that, that if someone opens up your chest and they look at the heart that is beating in your chest, that you're going to see the new covenant wrote there on your heart. I'm not talking about the one that beats in the chest. I'm talking about your inner man. The Lord was talking about writing, engraving the new covenant on the soul. Now, who is it that this new covenant is written on? Who is it that will receive this engraving again? It is made very clear for us over in the 16th chapter of John's gospel and the seventh verse. Where in the 16th chapter of John's gospel, in the seventh verse, Jesus, he said to the disciples, he said, it is to your advantage that I go away, that I leave you. Now, why would Jesus, why would he say that to the disciples? Why was it that Jesus, why did he, why did he have to go away? Well, if we skip down there to the 13th verse, we'll see. Jesus, he said to the disciples, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. The helper, Jesus said, is the spirit of truth, not lies, not gossip, not rumors, not conspiracies, not fantasy that you make up in your own mind. And we'll see there in the 14th verse that the role of the spirit of truth is to guide believers into all truth, the divine truth. The spirit of truth declares the scripture says there, what is of Christ to all who are of sincere faith. What is it that the spirit of truth declares that is of Christ? What is it that is of Christ? What is it that Christ has given to the world? He is again given us hope. And that hope is salvation. The spirit of truth declares unto us salvation. The spirit of truth leads us unto salvation. Again, down the path to glory. Over in the seventh chapter of John's gospel in the 38th verse, Jesus, he spoke of those who can receive the spirit of truth, who can receive the helper. There in the 38th verse, Jesus said, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And to clarify, because many of us will look at that verse and will say, well, what does that mean? You know, what is Jesus talking about there? You know, how can, how can living waters flow from, from out of our heart? Well, John there in the 39th verse, he brings a bit of clarity for us there. Where John said that Jesus, he was saying those things concerning the Holy Spirit, whom only those that believe in Christ can receive. Only those who confess their faith, only those who are of sincere faith, only we who are of true and genuine faith today, only we receive the Holy Spirit. And again, the Holy Spirit is the one that engraves the new covenant, not on the heart that's beating in our chest, but on our soul today. See, the spirit of truth, the helper, again, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of promise. We see that from Jesus. It's the spirit of promise to all of those who confess faith. And as Paul made clear to those in the church of Ephesus, I make clear to all of you today, the Holy Spirit is another seal of the promise of salvation. It's the second of the two immutable things that the writer of the epistle of the Hebrews spoke about. So since the spirit of truth, since the spirit of truth abides with me, I again, I throw the question out there to all of you today. Why should I ever be concerned with what a denier of the Lord, a denier of salvation, a denier of hope, a denier of 
the kingdom of heaven, the premise of God, why should I concern myself with what they have to say? Are you a child of God today? Do you confess faith in your heart today? Are you committed to the Lord today? Then the Holy Spirit has written, has engraved the new covenant on your heart today. So why should you be concerned with what some denier has to say about your salvation? Why, why should you be concerned about someone telling you that your faith is for nothing? Why should you be concerned about someone saying to you, well, you praying for nothing. You praying to a guy you cannot see. Why should you concern yourself with what they have to say? And again, it makes you wonder why so many believers are concerned about what others think about their faith. It makes you wonder why so many sincere believers not professed ones. I ain't talking about those who are of religion. I'm talking about those who are of true faith. It makes you wonder why we get so concerned about someone talking about us going to church or someone who denies the Lord that talks about our prayer life. Yes, I'm praying. Yes, I pray to the Lord each and every day. Yes, I walk by faith. Because I know that it is for something. And I know what that something is. It's heaven. It's promised to me by the Lord. That is what I am going to, and I couldn't be concerned. I could not care less about what a denier has to say to me about my Lord and about what my God has promised to me. The giving of Christ and the Holy Spirit as an oath to God's immutable counsel, his faith. It again, it shows us today just how committed God is to us. You should, you should see today just how committed God is to you. The last thing that any of us should ever do is give up on God. Do you hear me here today? The last thing that any of us should ever do is give up on God. Why should we give up on God when he hasn't given up on us? Why should you give up on God when, when he hasn't given up on you? Especially based on the words of someone who don't know the Lord. Based on the words of someone who's not in fellowship with the Lord. I'm not giving up God for someone who don't know the first thing about the Lord. You should trust the Lord with all your heart. You should lean on him, not your own understanding and not the understanding of someone that doesn't know him. You should commit your way to the Lord and not be committed to the way of, of a liar or someone who is blind to the way of one who is a fool who will lead you to destruction. You should trust the Lord with all your heart. As you go down the path to glory, you should be faithful and you should be confident in what God has promised to you. And you should be committed to your walk of faith. My word to all of you today is to rest assured. Jesus, he said assuredly to you. Rest assured in the hope and rest assured in the promise that God has made to you because God, he is faithful. My word for you today is to again, rest assured in what God has taken an oath on Christ, the Holy spirit. He has sealed your salvation. Be confident in the sealing of your salvation. When someone tells you that your walk of faith is for nothing, you smile at them in confidence, knowing that God is faithful to what he has promised. And then you turn and you walk away from him. God has promised and he has sealed our reward. And all we have to do is keep on walking, keep on moving, and we will receive that reward. 
as the writer said there in the last of my key verses there in the 19th verse, our hope, that is our hope in the Lord, our hope in what he has promised, our hope in salvation, that is an anchor for our soul. We are anchored in the Lord today, or better yet, I should say to all of you, you should be, you ought to be anchored in the hope of the Lord. And, and with that anchor, there is nothing that can move you. Not all of those that are around you, not the storms of life, not the devil as well. Again, I want you to know that your faith, that it is not for nothing. It is for the great reward of the Lord, which he gave his son for us to have, who made that pathway possible for us to go down and for us to receive. So be committed, remain committed, remain faithful on this pathway. Amen. 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 Hey there, thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's sermon. I hope again that you took something out of this week's sermon that you can apply it to yourself and that you can walk in it, that you can live by faith. Make sure that you share this week's message. Make sure you're sharing it with someone somewhere. And again, I hope that you'll come back for next week's sermon. Make sure that you're following the channel so that you don't miss the next notification for next week's sermon so that you don't miss a notification for the Sunday school lessons, the Bible studies or the food for thoughts as well. Make sure that you're following the channel today.